pray that you entered here today with a grateful heart. We'll give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His what? His mercy endures forever. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16, or turn on your electronic device and pull it up on your phone or your tablet or whatever you may be looking to the Word of God from today. Uh, but we're, we have returned to Luke chapter 16. We took one Sunday break from it last week just to, uh, well, we had the baby dedication to begin with, and then we, I wanted I wanted to go over our memory verses last two months, and if you paid any attention to the bulletin, you'll see that we are at Second Peter chapter 1, verse 7, continuation of Peter's reminders there of what we are to do with our faith. Coming to Christ is not the end. Coming to Christ is just the beginning, and we're to grow forward in our faith. But today we're returning to Luke's gospel, and we're looking at this uh, this uh, passage in which we we start out with verse 1 and we see him speaking of a certain rich man. Next week, Lord willing, and depending on other, well, his willingness and my plan is to continue on in Luke 16, where in verse 19 we'll see there was a certain rich man. So verse 1 starts with there was a certain rich man. Verse 19, there's a certain rich man. And today we'll see where, where we're, Jesus is talking and actually exposing the Pharisees and their love for money. So this, the parables before us deal with, with riches and deal with focus on that instead of focus on the kingdom of God. But today we're going to read down verses or down through verses 14 through 18. So please follow along. Luke chapter 16, verses 14 through 18. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. Uh, that means one crossing of the T, one dotting of the I, the, the least little bit of a letter of the law. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. And that may seem disconnected in what Jesus is talking about here, but I, I pray that, uh, that we will see the continuity that's actually throughout these verses. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I am so grateful to be able to call you Father. I, I thank you for redemption, and I thank you for um, new life in your family I thank you that all those who turn from their sins, who responds to your gracious call and turns from their sins, turning to Christ in faith, or that uh, we experience being ushered into your family, adopted into your family, we become joint heirs with Christ. Father, we thank you that your spirit uh, not only brings us new life, awakens us, quickens us, as the King James says, but also comes to dwell within. And where your spirit dwells, there is the desire then, Father, to glorify you, to live for your glory and for your kingdom. There is a desire to live in accordance to your word. So, Father, we pray that your spirit will teach us today, take your word, which he is the author of it, the holy and errant word of God, and bring us understanding. And Father, use your word to strengthen and to grow forward the child of God. And use your word to speak to those who are in darkness, those who do not know you, and bring them to saving knowledge of you through your word, your word becoming light to them. Reveal yourself to them through your word. 
Father, we know that only you can soften hardened hearts and only you can open blinded eyes. And we pray that your word, your spirit will take your word and bring life. And Father, that your word will minister to our entire inner being, heart, mind, will. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As you'll see in the title today, it's the message has been entitled, The Kingdom of God and the Heart of Man. When you hear the kingdom of God, just that phrase, the kingdom of God, what comes to mind? What comes to mind to you? The kingdom of God. Is it something that in your mind is sort of mysterious? Maybe something distant, something future yet? Everybody would have their opinion. Some would even think fictional instead of factual. Kingdom of God. What, what interest does that hold, that phrase hold in your heart and in your mind, the kingdom of God? And then the phrase, and the heart of man. The kingdom of God and the heart of man. And is there any continuity there? Is there any is there, is there a, a joining of those two thoughts? The kingdom of God and the heart of man. Well, we see in the study today that there were those professing to be part of the kingdom, and yet their hearts were far from it, and far from the things of God. When we look at this passage that we just started, I think it would do it, we would do it justice if we go back just one verse. Just one verse. So we're going to have that. Today I'm using New American Standard. You might ask, well, why do you switch around? I just think there are times that some translations give us a little more clarity without losing the proper interpretation from the original languages of, of whether that be the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Hebrew, the, the Greek. So I want to look at verse 13, if we can, please. And we purposely put verses up on the screen because not everybody carries a Bible. Not everybody will pull it up on their, their electronic device. Not everyone will actually open it and, and look at it. And so I feel any time I can get the Word of God before you, I, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And so... Keeping in mind of Jesus' teaching, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this one more time. You, when you look at verse 1 of, verse six, of chapter 16, he said, and he said also to his disciples, there was a certain rich man. And then he gives that parable, and we won't take the time to do that again. But he's challenging his disciples to be wise, to be shrewd, to be savvy, to make the most of their resources in this life to be treasuring up for the life that's yet to come, eternal life. So to live continually, eternally minded. And then he shows up that, that teaching time there with verse 13. And so here it is. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth, and, and the King James, New King James, mammon, worldly riches, worldly wealth, money and another type of, of wealth, that you can't serve both. You cannot do that. It, there is only going to be one supreme love, one supreme loyalty in our lives. There's going to be one thing, a uh, person or thing that we're going to be really devoted to. There's only one first place in our lives. How many understand that? Everything else is secondary. I, everything else is somewhat subordinate to that. And so what Jesus is saying, you, you can't serve both. You, you can't serve God and, and, and live for God and his kingdom and live for this world and its riches both. You can't do both. One is, is, is going to take first place. Okay. So here, here's an application for you, if we can, please. 
Who or what has your love and devotion? God or wealth? The way we spend our time, money, and resources reveals the truth, doesn't it? We, we can say, we can talk. The Pharisees were good at talking and, 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 and boasting about their love for God and their morality and their righteousness, but their, their actions disproved that. We need to be reminded. We need to be challenged from time to time. Where is my love? Where is my devotion? I can say this, but does my day-by-day -day life prove differently? See, Jesus' words were intended to probe into their inner being and really expose. And that's what he's doing here with the Pharisees. So keep in mind, this is the last thing Jesus said, verse 13, prior to now going, coming on to verse 14. So he's already put it in their heads. Go back to 13 just for a minute, please. Thank you, Eric. This is what he said to them last. No servant can serve two masters. No servant can serve two masters. We all serve something, right? And man in our our ruined state, our, our, our natural inclination is to serve self. Uh, that, that old song, if you can't please everyone, you might as well just what? You remember that? Please yourself. And, and really, most people were about ourselves. But when the Spirit of God comes and brings new life, He puts in us a new desire, a new disposition. Now that old live, the old man still resides, and, and we'll have that constant battle. But the child of God battles through that and says, no, I'm not first anymore. God is first. I mean, hey, did anybody have that battle this past week? Uh, of who am I living for, himself or God? What's first? You know, we're sure we have. We have all had that. But, but the child of God fights against those natural tendencies. Because the spirit of God puts within us the desire to please God. And not only puts within that desire, but he enables and he empowers. And he chastens when we do go astray. So this is the last thing that Jesus said. And once again, we find the Pharisees not real pleased with what Jesus had just mentioned. In fact... God's Word says they derided him. Eric, if we can have those next two verses. Now the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees. Who were the Pharisees? They were that sect, that group of separatists who, who really prided themselves on keeping the law and not only the law, but a whole bunch of man-made laws too. But they were so super... And time and time again, Jesus is exposing them through the gospel. We see him challenging them. They're constantly challenging him. They're constantly dogging at him or dogging him. And Jesus often turns around and points out to them their sin. And here, this is what we have today. So the Pharisees, the religious group who saw themselves above and beyond everybody else, who saw them holier than thou, if you will, the religious elite, if you will. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money. This is what God's Word says. Now were there exceptions? Sure there were exceptions. There's always exceptions. But for the most part, the Pharisees were lovers of money. What was number one to them? What was their drive? What was their devotion? What was their loyalty? It was money and riches. It was for this life now to get all they could, to have that mentality of let's eat, drink, and be married. Tomorrow you may die. So serve yourself. That was their mentality. 
Pharisees were lovers of money. We're listening to all these things. They were listening to what Jesus was saying. Good. He had their attention. That was his intention. For them to hear what he was saying. For them to understand, look. God sees right through your facade. You may have these other people duped. You may have these other people fooled. But you sure don't have God fooled. You know what? That's a good application. Isn't it? Because we don't fool God. He sees everything. All these things, and they were ridiculing him. When you look at that word, derided, what does that mean? Well, it means to scoff. It means to scorn. It means to mock. It actually means in the Greek, sneering, like turning up their nose at him. To me, that's just like unheard of. And yet maybe we do that sometimes when we look to God's word and it challenges us. You see, they were challenged. They understood what Jesus was getting at. He was calling them out on, of their covetousness. And they were guilty. Now, what do you do when you're guilty of something? Well... You sure don't want to think that, or sometimes people don't want to admit they're wrong. Hey, anybody have a problem with that here today? Admitting that you're wrong? Like Fonzie, I was wrong. Can't get it out of my mouth. Well, they had two choices. To accept that they, they're wrong. That they have been exposed and they, they can't argue his doctrine. They know he's right. Or they can scoff him for it. And that's what they did. When knowing deep down they were wrong. They were wrong. So they're ridiculing. They're scoffing. How did Jesus respond to that? And he said to them. Here's what it is. Verse 15. No, no, no. Back, buddy. I don't know what happened to the little numbers. I had little numbers for each verse. Well, verse 15 starts, and he said to them, and he said to them. You know, Jesus, God's word says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. He didn't go behind their backs or anything. He, he right in your face. Jesus was meek and mild, but Jesus was no coward. He called him out. He says, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the sight of people, but God knows your heart. Because that which is highly esteemed among people is detestable in the sight of God. You are the ones who justify yourselves in the sight of people. In other words, you know you're living wrong, but you make excuses for that. You explain it all away. Yes, I know, but. Jesus says, there are no buts here. You're the ones who justify yourself in the sight of but God knows your heart. And I want to spend just a couple moments on that. He does know our hearts. And for the child of God, I think, for myself anyhow, for the last 37 almost going on 40 years of knowing Christ as my Lord and Savior. It's comforting for me to know that He knows my heart. But for somebody to not know God and to hear He knows your heart, that should be terrifying. In the sense of you don't hide anything from God. You may be thinking you're getting away with things, but you're not. And also, though, know that this, that love, that God is love, lovingly gracious and merciful and forgiving. And if you would bring that unrepentant heart to Him, if you would come, if you would turn from that, He will graciously forgive you. He'll give you that heart of flesh that Ezekiel talks about.
it brings me comfort to know he knows my heart. And I don't know how many times in a, in a week I'll say, God, you know my heart. When struggles come in to the mind, and they do, don't they? Wrong things. Anybody deal with wrong thoughts coming in your mind? About six of you shaking your head. And I tell God. In fact, I talk to God more than I talk to anybody in a week, and that's just truth. And people think I'm crazy. They're going down the road. Blah, 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 blah. Who's he muttering to? Who's, who's, well, who's Dad talking to downstairs? Sometimes it is. It is verbal. It, it, it's out loud. A lot of times it's just right up here. And I don't know how many times I say, but God, you know my heart. I don't want those thoughts coming here. It's, it's my fallen flesh. And he knows that. And there's great comfort and assurance. You know this heart. You know I don't want to think that way. Help me not to think that way. You know my heart. There's comfort in that. But for the heart that's not right with God, he knows your heart. You can't hide anything from him. I think it was Tozer in his pursuit of God, uh, some, something to this, this uh, nature, where he talked about open or living a life of, a, of our soul being an open window to God. Living in complete transparency because he sees it all anyhow. Life is so much easier that way, isn't it? To just live in, in understanding that it's all open before him. To live in complete transparency before God. These Pharisees were not living in transparency. They were hiding behind a facade. They did have this super righteousness way about themselves that they carried themselves with. And, and, and Jesus was exposed to saying, you're, you're, you're hypocrites. You come across like you're holier now, but let me tell you, you're not holy. Your righteousness does not cut it. And then he also says in this, but, but God knows your hearts because that which is highly esteemed among people is detestable in the sight of God. And I was, I was thinking about, I, I don't watch hardly much TV at all, but, but whether it's TV stars, whether it's movie stars, that almost seems dated, doesn't that phrase, movie stars? Doesn't that seem a little dated? Sports heroes. These people that are in the limelight, these people getting all the rewards, various things, yeah, yeah, yeah. And look how many, and I'm not saying all, so please don't misunderstand me. Look how many of them are so immoral. Music artists. So immoral, and yet people just applaud them and esteem them. God says, no, 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 a lot of things, not everything. Because there are things that man holds in high esteem that, that are moral and that are upright and brings God glory and honor. But there are many things that this world applauds that are abominable, that is flat out wrong, and to use New American Standard, is detestable in the sight of men. In the sight of God, I mean. You find yourself envious of people like that because of their riches, because of their fame, because of their fortune, because of, uh, of being so renowned? No, that's detestable to God. And so he's calling them out. He's calling them out on it. Do me a favor, turn over to uh, 1 Timothy 6, just real quickly. 1 Timothy 6. <clears throat> I was going to just read this off to you, but I'd rather you turn and look to it. And just a little bit about riches, okay? Just a little bit. You could go different places with this, but uh, in this whole matter of the Pharisees being lovers of money, Paul's Paul pouring into that young pastor Timothy, Paul the mentor, Timothy the mentee, uh, pouring into him. And this is what he says, starting with verse 6. 
Well, we could actually back up to verse 5 uh, of these false teachers, of people like these Pharisees even, whose useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute to the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. And what does Paul tell young Timothy to do? From such withdraw yourself. When you see a person, a uh, so-called preacher, so-called teacher, so-called religious dude, who's really about personal gain, you need to just get away from that person. Then he says this. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. How many can you say, how many of you can say amen to that? You know, isn't that another blessing as being a child of God? We have a pumpkin back there with little pieces of paper. This isn't random. I'm, I'm connecting this. Hold on with me. Of just writing thankful things or things that you're thankful for, things that are blessings to you, just little cards back there to just, you know, to the glory of God, praising God. Anyhow, that's back there at the table. I am thankful of the truth of God's word. I'm thankful that, yes, Godliness with contentment is great gain. I, I didn't know contentment until I came to know Christ. Isn't there a contentment in being a child of God? No, no, don't get me wrong. We still strive. We still, we still move forward. We still want things. But, but at the whole time, we're very content. It's like Paul in Philippians 4 where he's talking about have learned the secret to be, to be content in all things. Whether he has much, whether he has little, it doesn't matter what I have. Because I'm content in Christ. My contentment lies in, in God, in his kingdom, not in the things of this world. Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. We probably heard that reworded a little bit differently, but it's true, isn't it? There's no hearse behind, or yeah, there's no U-Haul behind a hearse, as they say. And you can fill that coffin with everything you want. But where you're going, it's not going with you. Wherever you're going. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich, where is your desire today? Where is your loyalty today? Who is first? What is first in your life today? But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. In other words, eternal ruin. If your sights are continually set on more, 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 got to have more, 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 your sights are set on the wrong thing. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to result in eternal ruin. Then verse 10, and, and not a show of hands again, but think about this before I even read verse 10. How many times do we hear the phrase, money's the root of all evil? Money's the root of all evil. Well, that's a misquote. Money is just money. It, it, it's, it's unanimated and an unanimated object. It's just something that we, we, we use each and every day of our lives. It's just, it's just economy, part of economy. And so money in itself is not evil. But when you look at verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. We started out with the Pharisee who were lovers of money. Right there's the connection. And purposely using this passage, again, for God's Word, to remind you of what God's Word says, but also to allow God's Word, through the person of His Holy Spirit, to probe our inner persons to see where we're at on things when it comes to worldly wealth and the kingdom of God. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. Greed has a way of doing that, doesn't it? More, more, more just keep puts you on this quest for, you're, you, you now are just blind and, and oblivious to everything else, and, and this is your objection to get more, more, more. So which have some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O oh man of God, flee these things. And pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith, and so on. Where are you at today? What fight are you fighting? Are you fighting for 
love and godliness and truth? Or are you fighting for the pursuit of the temporal things of this world? Well, back to our study in Luke chapter 16. But I just wanted to prop that up a little bit with that cross-reference of what Jesus was talking about, them being lovers of money, and for it to challenge us of where are we at in those areas. And so the right, the scribes, the, or the Pharisees, uh, they justified themselves. In other words, they relied on their own righteousness, their self-righteousness. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, For they being ignorant of God, of God's righteousness, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God, Romans 10.3. And so, what righteousness are you relying on today? The righteousness of God or on your own good merit? You think, well, that's a no-brainer. No, you'd be surprised. How many people deep down inside, what they're relying on is, I'm a good person, and my good outweighs the bad, and that's what I'm banking on. And God's word says no. No, there is no self-righteousness that is acceptable to God. Because there is no really self-righteousness, because we're not right in of ourselves. And so the righteousness, the justification that we can only plead is the righteousness of Christ and the justification being declared right before God through faith in Him, in, in Jesus. And so we find them deriding themselves, we find, or deriding Jesus, scoffing, mocking, sneering at him. Can you just see that in your mind? Here's the Son of God. Here's the, the greatest teacher that ever spoke. And they're scoffing his teaching. And they're scoffing his doctrine. And so Jesus points out to them their, their, their folly. He points out to them their sin. He exposes them completely, sh- reveals to them what they are really truly trusting in, and that is their own self-righteousness. And so then he says this to them in verses 16 and 17, if we can. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John came. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the letter of the law to fail. Now let's unpack this a little bit here. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John came. What is he talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about how God sent his prophets to minister to the people of Israel, proclaiming the word of God, proclaiming truth to them, calling them out of their sin, calling them to repent, calling them to be true to the true and living God. That's what the prophets did. And look how many of the prophets, most of the prophets were received. (laughs) They got the reception that we find Jesus receiving from the Pharisees in our passage today. I mean, read Hebrews chapter 11 as far as what took place with some of the prophets, of how they were treated, how they were murdered. And we look at Jesus, of course. The prophet that Moses spoke about would come to crucify them. Jesus said the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, were proclaimed until John came. Day after day, the prophets, and there was false prophets just like there are today, but the true prophets of God proclaiming the truth of God, calling the people of God back. Jesus says the law and the prophets... What we find in what we call the Old Testament were proclaimed until John came. John was the beginning of a new age. John was the closing of the old, ushering in the new. He was the forerunner of Christ. And remember what John's message was. The same message of Jesus, the same message of the apostles should be the same message that ministers share today. 
John came on the scene, wild man, camel hair, leather belt, eating locusts and honey. And he sure wasn't afraid of, of being politically correct. I don't know if he even understood that phrase. And he sure didn't care if he ruffled feathers. No, he had a calling, and that was to be the forerunner of Christ. And his message was simple. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus come on the scene. We read this in Matthew 4 then. We read Matthew 3, Jesus, or John's preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We come to Matthew 4, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You see, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John came. And then once John came, he's, he's proclaiming the gospel, the good news of Christ, that the prophet has come, the Son of God that the prophets shared about, constantly pointing to, has now arrived. Now, who's Jesus speaking to in this passage? He's speaking to the Pharisees. You've got to keep that in mind. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John came. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom has been preached. Praise God, it continues to be preached. And you know what? Though it may fall like, or seem like it falls on deaf ears, people are still coming to the saving knowledge of Christ. And Christ is tarrying. The Father has Christ waiting. God's willing, not willing that any should perish. Why hasn't Jesus returned yet? Because God is long-suffering. Because there's more people to come to saving knowledge of Him. That's why. If in the fullness of time God forth, or sent forth His Son, in the fullness of time He sent Him forth the first time, it's going to be the fullness of time that He returns. And that fullness of time is when God says, okay, okay, it's time, it's time to call them home. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom has been preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. Now, this can be a little obscure, and I've read a lot of scholars, a lot of commentaries on this. But I want you to remember, how many times in our studies of Luke have we seen multitudes of people coming to hear Jesus? Remember, they were, they were pressing against one another to where people were falling out and getting hurt. An innumerable multitude of people we read. What is that saying? It's saying that people were responding to Jesus' message. The law and the prophets, the Old Testament has been proclaimed for hundreds of years. Now John proclaims the king has come. The kingdom is before you. And all these tax collectors and, and these just common people, they're hearing Jesus' words. The Spirit of God is calling and drawing, and they're coming by the droves to him. People are responding. People are responding. And the Pharisees, they're hindering them. There's always going to be the religious people hindering those who want to come to saving knowledge of Christ, trying to get in the way, trying to push religion in place of relationship. And this is what we see here with the Pharisees. In fact, Jesus said to them, he says, woe to you, in, in Matthew 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. You're always getting in the way. But there are plenty of people coming to saving knowledge. And I am grateful to this day. Here we are, 2022. And people are still coming to saving knowledge of Christ. The kingdom is advancing. Jesus says he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It was just a couple of weeks ago, I guess, yeah, two or three where uh, an older man saw his sinfulness and, and cried out to ask Christ to forgive him and cleanse him and then desired to be baptized. He is working. He is calling. He is drawing. You won't stop the gospel. 
And so since the time of the gospel, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. In other words, it becomes most important. There is zeal, there is desire, there is eagerness. Fighting our way. Get out of my way, scribes, Pharisees. Get away from me, doubts and fears and everything else that would hinder me. No, no. The king is calling and I'm coming. Does that describe you? Does that describe you? And then he says in verse 17, But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the letter of the law to fail. Now, why did he say this? This is where for some it seems like there's a disconnection, but there is not. He's saying, though the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John came, though John has come, and now the gospel message has come, that does not nullify, that does not do away with the Old Testament. Nor does it do away with God's moral law. And that's what he's pointing out to them. Hey, Pharisees, you're missing it. You pride yourselves in being so righteous. You pride yourself in being such, uh, uh, applying the law with such scrutiny, and yet you, you're blind to it. You're to the letter of the law, but you don't understand the spirit of the law. And so Jesus coming, fulfilling the law, culminating the law, not doing away with the law. That's why we've been studying Pathways to Freedom at uh, Tuesday nights here, Wednesday night at Faith Bible, of helping us to understand that the, that, the, that the moral law of God has not been done away with. And that we do find the commandments throughout the New Testament. And yes, we understand we're saved by grace through faith. But that doesn't mean we just live any way we want to now because we're saved by grace through faith. No. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's not keeping the commandments that saves our souls, but if our souls have truly been saved, we will have a desire to live in accordance to God's word. And that's just truth. And so he, he gives this hyperbole here that heaven and earth, it'd be easier for, for everything to just pass away before one little stroke of the law of God to pass, to fail. It's not going to fail. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119, verse 89. The word of God is forever settled in heaven. God's word does not change. God does not change. He's the immutable God, James tells us. In Hebrews, it reads, or we read Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus is the living word. The word of God stands forever. And that's what Jesus is pointing out to them. And now lastly, before we go... Uh, before we come to this time of the Lord's table, and I should have made mention of that, uh, if you're born again, child of God, if you have repented of your sins, if you have come to Christ, you remain in Christ, Jesus is your Savior, He calls us to His table. He calls us to His table. And so there's communion sets up here on the table, uh, and I encourage you to get one if you are a child of God. And I don't mean a general child of God, that God's the Father of all. I mean that you have come to saving knowledge of Christ. And that God is your Heavenly Father. But then we come to verse 18, and now this may even seem more of a, and I don't have it on the screen, uh, may seem like even more of a disconnect. Why is he bringing this up now? Look at verse 18. Everybody look at verse 18. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Okay. New Living Translation. Let me read to you verse 17 and verse 18. But that doesn't mean... Jesus says you're missing it. You're missing it. You've twisted the law to your advantage. God created a male and female. The two shall be one. Malachi tells us that God hates divorce. And Jesus does make it very clear. There are exceptions here. When there is sexual immorality, he gives that exception as far as in marriage. When, when unfaithfulness takes place, there, there is that exception. He's not preaching on divorce so much as he is ex once again exposing their, their unrighteousness that they prided themselves in. 
You guys have totally blown the law out of the water. You're saying you're righteous, and yet one of the most important things in life, our relationship first with God, and then if we're married with our spouse, and you make light of it to serve yourself. No, that's wrong, Jesus says. And I think it was another time of teaching to them and exposing them. They said, no, no, you're not keepers of the law. You don't have it right. Even in, your, in the relationship that's supposed to be dearest in your life with the exception of our relationship to God, you, 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 you find ways around that. He was exposing their sin. Exposing their sin. So we need to take a look at this and allow the Word of God to challenge our hearts this morning. Who or what do we love first and foremost? Where is our devotion? Where is our loyalty? How do we hold, how do we look at things in this world and the riches of this world? Do we hold things with an open hand, knowing the Lord gives, the Lord takes, blessed be the name of the Lord? And do we understand that because we come to, or that when we come to saving knowledge of God and we're saved by His grace, that the Word of God and the commands of God aren't out the window now. No, no, they're there for us. They're a mirror. They're to show us who God is. They're to, it is to show us our sin, and it is to show us how we're to live as, as God's children. That's what it's there for. And when we look at the Word of God, we're reminded of what God calls His church to do, what Jesus calls His church to do, which moves us into this time of closing our time of worship in the Lord's, at the Lord's table. And so I want to give you a couple of verses from, from uh, Corinthians. Ha, study that, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where the church has made such a mess out of communion, out of the Lord's table. And they did. They were arriving early. They were getting drunk. They were eating ahead of others. They were having their little cliques, and the others were left out. And Paul said, whoa, time out. Read it for yourself, 1 Corinthians 11. He said, this is, this is not what the Lord intended in this matter of coming together, a time of communion, a time of fellowship, a time of breaking the bread. So here's what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now hold on, we're going to do communion here in just a minute. A little different than times before. Next two verses says this. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. What is he saying? In our obedience to the sacrament or to the ordinance of communion, we're proclaiming the gospel. We're saying we believe what Jesus has said. That, that the bread represents his body which was given. That, his, that the cup represents his blood that was shed for our sins. And when we do this, we are proclaiming his sacrificial death. And we are proclaiming that we believe he is coming again just like he said. And, and so when we, keep, when we observe the Lord's table, we're being obedient to the command that Christ has left his church. And then Paul says this, and this is very important. Let a person examine himself. God knows your heart, right? If receiving communion today was based on, I, I, I didn't fall any last week. I didn't have any sins last week. I got it right 100% last week. I would not be taking this communion. Perhaps even, did I get it right of just today so far? No, I probably blew it a little bit somewhere. Our salvation is not based on our works. We're saved by grace through faith. We're, we're, our righteousness is the righteousness of Christ given to us. We come to him and we trust him. But God's word does tell us that this is not something we need, that we are to do unadvisedly. This is not something that we should do without thought. 
this is not something that we should take part of without taking a deep look within it. And not only our look, but asking God, search my heart, God. Is there bitterness in my life right now? Is there unforgiveness in my life right now? Am I living in sin right now? Then, then to take and do and and take part of the bread and the, the cup to, to receive communion, knowing those things, that's an injustice. Because when we take the bread and we take the cup, we're having communion, partnership, participation. We are part of the body. We are the body, and, and Christ is the head. And we're saying, oh, this is good. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. That's being flippant about it. If we don't come, asking him to search our hearts out. We know that 1 John tells us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Who should be at this table? Those who have been born from above. Those who are, who are followers of Christ. But we need to do so. Come to the table with clean hands and a pure heart. And so let's take a moment to ask the Lord to search us, to pray, and then we'll take of the bread and we'll take of the cup. Our Father, we are grateful that you are long-suffering, that you are forgiving. We thank you for the price of our forgiveness, the very blood of Christ, that we were redeemed not with silver or gold, but his precious blood, his very life blood. And so, Father, as we take of this bread, representing his body, as we take of this cup, representing his blood, we do so, Father, with grateful hearts that, one, uh, you have called us and drawn us into your family, that through faith in Christ, through his death, resurrection, that we have redemption. And so in obedience to your word, we do take of the bread. So Jesus being the bread of life, which we sang about, let us take of the bread. I think of the cup, I think of the blood of Christ, I think of Ephesians where it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Remembrance of Christ, let us drink of the cup. <clears throat> we'll close our time of worship one last song.
Father, we are so thankful for your grace. We're so thankful for all of your attributes, your goodness towards us, your long-suffering, your, your mercy, your forgiveness. Father, help us to be challenged by your word, to be examined by your word. Help us to repent of the sins that, that you revealed to us through your spirit and your word. And help us to live for your glory and your honor in all of our days. This we thank you and ask in Jesus' name.